Welcome to the Healthy Habits for Active Aging podcast with your hosts, physical therapists, Dr. Michael Gorman and Dr. Lauren Bennett. This podcast will discuss a variety of health-related topics focused on educating the aging adult, allowing for an active lifestyle no matter the age. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and share. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to another edition of the Healthy Habits for Active Aging podcast. My name is Dr. Michael Gorman. And I'm Dr. Lauren Bennett. And we are two physical therapists coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, if this is your first time joining this podcast, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Where have you been the last, uh, mm -hmm. what, 32 weeks? Where have you been? But we're very happy that, that you're here. And if you're a regular, thank you for coming back every week. And we do hope that you find this enjoyable. And not only are we on this podcast, but also check us out on the iMove PT YouTube page. So welcome aboard, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk about something called trigger points. You may have heard of this. You may not have um, heard of trigger points. But one thing is, you know, we know, Lauren, there's no guarantees in life, but we can pretty much guarantee that every human being on uh, that walks this earth has had a trigger point at some point in time, whether they knew what it was or not, but I guarantee that. <laughs> um, whether you know it's a trigger point or you're like my husband and you refer to them as, can you just dig your elbow into this boulder <laughs> in my shoulder? It's probably a trigger point. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that too before as well. So they're called all kinds of things, but um, yeah, it's uh, something that's that again, almost everyone have, has, but we thought it'd be great to start talking about this because uh, the next two weeks after this podcast, we're going to delve into the world of dry needling. So I thought it made a lot of sense uh, for us to start with this. But so we need to always talk about the why, the why is this, why is this important? And this is striking, but over 70, between 75 to 100 million people and the United States are estimated to suffer from some type of chronic pain. And Dr. Ben, I don't know about you, but that was like, that's a, uh, you know, almost a third of the population of the, of the United States. Mm -hmm. or I would say a large majority of my caseload too, as a physical therapist. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Also 80% of nursing home residents, this is, this is, uh, uh, I don't know if it's surprising or not, but 80% of nursing home re residents may have substantial chronic pain that is undertreated. And then lastly, over 50% of the patients that have chronic pain have been in pain for five years or more. And, you know, I don't know about you, and I, I've been blessed to never, um, well, never have had significant chronic pain. But if you've had chronic pain, it is, it, it can wear on you because, mm -hmm. you know, Lauren and I, because Lauren and I treat this every day, it totally changed the the personality of the um, of the person that that has chronic pain. Definitely, yeah. I mean, it doesn't it just doesn't affect somebody physically. It affects you emotionally, mentally. Can get involved in your work and your family when you can't do things. And yes, it's a big reason why patients need help and physical therapy. It's a big big um help to this if you get the right pt yeah we we we've talked about this before in past podcasts that you can't separate the mind from the the body because uh really all chronic pain there is a uh there is a you know huge component that the, it's you know mediated from the brain as well because really if you have some type of injury let's say um, you have a ro rotator cuff strain or something like that. Well, it really should, the inflammatory phase, I don't want to get too deeper, but the inflammatory phase really in the whole scope of things lasts for what a short period of time, a few weeks, something like mm -hmm. that. So if it was just, if pain was solely based on inflammation, then, um, the pain would go away. But then once the spinal cord and the brain get involved, all things can go haywire. Yes. And I, I don't know exactly what episode it is off the top of my head, but a prior episode on chronic pain talks all about exactly what Dr. Gorman was talking about, what happens after that immediate acute inflammation subsides and why chronic pain becomes a thing and how to retrain your brain mm -hmm. um, and learn exactly what's going on with you. So that's a really, really good resource to go back. Um, but today we're just focusing on 
trigger points, exactly what is it. And we just wanted to go over the history to start of like where muscle pain comes from. So it was first described by Guillaume de Bayou. I'm probably butchering that, but wow, it was great the- job, Lauren. <laughs> goes back to the years in the 1600s he called it muscular rheumatism um, which was the first name of what myofascial pain is today and then 200 years later in 1816 um, Balfour described myofascial pain to be associated with actual thickenings and nodular tumors in the muscle So we're getting a little bit closer as to um, what my husband calls it today, boulders. (laughs) Um, And then a little while later in 1843, Froreep um, described the tender points as an accumulation of painful connective tissue. Um, So now we're getting to the 1900s. In the 1920s, myofasciitis and myofibrositis became new terms. And then in the mid 1900s, this was still being researched and scientists identified that these painful local areas in patients with myofascial pain were stimulated, stimulated the areas with a type of saline injection, and then found that the pain was reproduced. So we're getting closer. And then in 1977, the term um, in diagnosis fibromyalgia was founded um, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, but it, it has a lot to do with in, in the chronic pain world. Um, and now I'm going to let Dr. Gorman take it on from after the year of 1970. Well, I guess we're going back to the 1940s here with Dr. Sure. Travell. Well, you did a great job with those names. And it's safe to say if Guillaume de Bayou, if you didn't do a good job with pronouncing his name, he won't send you a DM because uh, he's from <laughs> 1600. Say the 1600s. So, you did a great job with that. And that's why I threw that section on you and not me, but great job. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about Dr. Janet Travell. Um, so uh, a trigger point was, was actually coined. That word was coined by Dr. Janet Travell in uh, 1942. Dr. Travell was a physician. She was born in um, 1901. She lived an amazing 95 years but anyway, she used this word trigger point to, to describe something I know all of you have experienced, but a, kind of a, we call it a hyper irritable uh, muscle spot. And um, you can actually feel it's a very tight. We call it a taut band that when we put our hands and fingers on you and we're feeling that's what we're trying to find with that, that trigger point is that, that taut band. But anyway, it was really Dr. Janet Travell that came along and uh, really uh, delve deep in, into this. So, I mean, she was really, um, she was just, I like to think of, and well, so many people, she was a true pioneer in this. And not only um, just talking about the the trigger points and what they are, but then really trying to re- relay the, the, the trigger points to, you know, acute pain, which lasts, you know, a few weeks to more chronic pain, which I don't know. I've heard different things about when chronic pain ac- actually starts, but to me, anything more than a couple weeks um, has turned into a chronic chronic pain state. In fact, if you've heard our podcast, Lauren and I both say that if you have pain more than five to seven days, you need to seek treatment on that because guess what? That's not going away. And unfortunately, too many times it turns into a chronic pain. But Quick quiz question. We had a uh, quiz question a few weeks ago, which unfortunately we didn't get the kind of response we were looking for. So we're not going to leave it to our audience to DM us to um, uh, get give us the answer. But Dr. Janet Travell was the personal physician of a very famous president. Ponder that. Think about that over your coffee or what, whatever you're drinking right now. And um, we'll answer that at the end of this mm-hmm. this podcast. And then, you know, we, uh, Dr. Travell also, she really pioneered, okay, these there's these trigger points. Well, so what 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 are we going to do with it? So um, she really, uh, her work was all about the treatment of the uh, myofascial pain, which trigger points are part of myofascial pain. Um, and then um, 
you know, so a lot of different treatments, including incorporating dry needling uh, into treatment of myofascial trigger points. So we first have to understand what exactly is a trigger point before we understand if we have one and how do we seek treatment for it and what should we do? So we're going to go into a little bit more detail of what actually is a trigger point. So in your muscle, you have muscle fibers and around the muscle fibers, there sometimes can be a tight band around these muscle fibers. And why does it happen? There's a lot of reasons, um, overuse baseball players that are constantly throwing with their right arm, repetitive lifting and carrying landscapers. I mean, it really could be anything if you're using it a lot repetitively, especially those muscles are getting a lot of, a lot of overuse, um, stress and anxiety. I know I'm a person when I have a lot to do or I'm stressed out, my shoulders immediately are up in my ears. And I actually have to tell myself to take a deep breath and like, just relax. So my, it would be common for like my upper traps and my shoulders to always feel tight and have those trigger points in there. You could easily find them. Um, poor nutrition and lack of sleep can cause trigger points to develop, which is kind of, kind of common sense. Poor nutrition and lack of sleep is going to lead to a lot of things. Um, sometimes this can cause pain, not only in the muscle that the trigger point is in, but our body has something called referred pain. So it's crazy how our body is wired with nerves. But even if you're having the trigger point, say in your shoulder, but you say, oh, I'm feeling it down my arm as well. Um, that's something that needs to be looked at in a medical professional to kind of rule out other diagnosis and know, you know, when I push directly on that trigger point that that reproduces pain elsewhere is what we would call referred pain. Um, I think we should talk about that for a sec because you can have referred pain, which is, um, you know, pain that's stemming from putting pressure on a trigger point and that pain spreads. And there's also pain, like if we're talking about a neck, there is pain that can come from a nerve root in your neck that can um, radiate down your arm as well. So just because you have pain in the arm, it doesn't mean the pain is coming from a trigger point or it doesn't mean the pain is coming from a nerve in the neck. And Lauren, how do we know which it is? We don't look it up <laughs> on the internet. We don't look up the World Wide Web. We go to a trained practitioner that does yes. a very thorough evaluation to know, okay, do you have a, maybe a herniated disc in your neck that's putting pressure on a nerve, or do you have pain in a trigger point in your shoulder that when we push on a boom, your pain shoots down your arm, or even worse, you have both. Yes. As we've said in just about every podcast, finding a PT or healthcare professional that can do a very thorough exam with differential diagnosis. We have these tests, special tests, hands-on therapy that we can do, and that will very clearly lead us to one versus the other without imaging. And we'll explain a little bit later on, but you can't just go get an MRI or an x-ray to say that you have a trigger point. So We'll get into that. Um, but same thing as like headaches. I deal with this a lot. Pa women, especially they're stressed out. They have desk jobs. Maybe their ergonomic setup in their office is not right. And their, um, armrests are so high. And then, you know, they have these trigger points in their shoulders and then they also complain of headaches. So please understand that headaches can be referred from trigger points as well. Um, and lastly, you'll find that when a PT or somebody, massage therapist, whoever it is, will touch that trigger point, it is usually very painful. You can say, yep, that's it. It's right there because inflammatory chemicals are inside of the trigger point. So we hope that that helps you understand a little bit more about exactly what a trigger point is. We're going to take a short commercial break from our sponsors at iMove PT. We are very grateful for them. And when we come back, we're going to discuss what types of trigger points there actually are out there. So stay with us. iMove PT is proud to be the sponsor for the Healthy Habits for Active Aging podcast. iMove PT is a mobile physical therapy company based out of St. Louis, Missouri and expanding throughout the United States. We bring a unique one-on-one -on -one physical therapy experience to the privacy, safety, and convenience of our patient's home, office setting, or the location of their choice. For more information about iMovePT, please go to www.imovephysicaltherapy.com 
or feel free to email us at info at imovephysicaltherapy.com. Have a great day. All right, welcome back, and thank you to our sponsor, iMove PT. So next, we're going to delve into types of trigger points. There's really two types of trigger points. There's what's called an active trigger point and a latent trigger point. I think the best way that I can describe this, and I will uh, give um, props here to a company called Myopain, which I'll talk about Myopain in a second, but that's where I've started my uh, dry needling training with, but they, in our course manual, they had um, a picture of an erupting volcano, and that's an active trigger point. And they had a picture of a mountain, the same mountain that has the same volcano, but it's inactive. So that's a latent trigger point. Either way, these are both very important to understand. So an active trigger point, as it might describe, man, that thing is that thing is aggravated. That that trigger point is not only very tender to touch, but it's 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 referring pain to whatever area that trigger points. Again, uh we every trigger point has every uh, muscle trigger point has a a referral pattern. So um, if you have an active trigger point, if that volcano is erupting, more than likely, let's say you have a trigger point in a muscle called your middle deltoid, which is um, on the outside of your shoulder, very likely that could refer pain going down your arm some. So that's an example. And so if it's active, you're probably going to have some referred pain where a latent trigger point is it's still going to be tender to touch, but it's not so much giving you um, significant pain at the moment. Again, it's that it's not going to refer pain. It's kind of that trigger point that's like that vol volcano or that mountain just sort of hanging out and it's going to wait um, for, for the explosion. Uh, and Dr. Travell, going back to Dr. Travell, she did say that at least 90% of people have trigger points. And honestly, I would say that that's, that 90% is 100% correct. It's Yeah. Uh, and I would, I would chime in here and say that, you know, my patients, a lot of times they get really, really caught up into what is that and why is it here and how do I get rid of it and how can I prevent it from coming again? And we'll, you know, explain that, but just understand, like Dr. Gorman said, 90% of people have trigger points. And I usually just say, look, it's from overuse. It's from an injury. It's from stress. Um, I have them too, you know, so we don't want them to be painful, but if you dig hard enough, you'll probably find one on just about everybody. For, for sure. Yeah. It's, you know, life is stressful and, uh, you know, as we get older, some of us have kids and you got work and you got this and that and you're keeping up with that social and this social and it's just a lot. And so it's not surprising that our muscular system, which is very powerful, it, it's going to, to break down on us. Mm -hmm. All right. So it is my experience. Uh, I've been a PT for 30 years. And my experience tells me that very few physicians out there, I'll get very few referrals for a patient that has trigger points. They may say that patient has neck pain or shoulder pain or something of that sort, but very rarely, it does happen every so often, but very rarely do I see the word trigger points. And we have to say, why is this? So why do our patients that are listening to us, why they've had these symptoms perhaps for years, but why have they never been told that? And again, this isn't to throw anyone under the bus by any means, but but most times when you go to see your physician, and it it we could talk as to why this is probably for a whole nother podcast, but it is rare when a physician spends the amount of time with you in the office to really touch or palpate different areas to see where trigger points might be. Again, it's a function, I think, a modern day healthcare and the insurance world and all that. So oftentimes the first, I got to be honest, I've heard this a lot. The first time a patient's injury has been touched is when they actually come in to see the physical therapist. And again, right. that's not to throw anyone under the bus by any means. There's some tremendous physicians and there's some that I wouldn't go see. And there's some tremendous mm -hmm. physical therapists and there's some, I wouldn't send my worst enemy to. So it just kind of <laughs> goes, goes hand in hand. But 
um, we have to get our hands on you and we have to palpate. We have to find out where these areas are. And when we push on these areas, does it refer, does it give you your, your, your pain pattern? Okay. Um, trigger points that are not diagnosed with x-rays or MRIs. Uh, I do know that if you have a diagnostic ultrasound, that can definitely show mm -hmm. these bands of taut muscle. It will, you can for sure, in, in, in the course I went to, they showed us a ton of um, diagnostic ultrasound pictures and where you could really see where there was a deformity or this contraction occurring. But again, X-ray, MRI, it's just, it's just not going to show. And then I just think that many people, um, uh, you know, we have to think of the muscular system, the musculoskeletal system of our body. It's a huge system of our body, but unfortunately, I don't think it's addressed enough. And, you know, we all, you know, you hear about the cardiovascular system, your pulmonary system, um, those types of things. But um, that could also be why people maybe haven't been diagnosed with trigger points like they probably should have. Any thoughts on yeah. that, Lauren? No, I would just say that, um, you know, when a patient may go to a doctor and then they prescribe physical therapy and I'm looking at the physical therapy script, they're so general these days because physical therapists, like we have an extensive education to get our doctorate. Like, you know, we are meant to just get these scripts that may just be so general and say neck pain, low back pain, radicular pain in the arm. Um, so it's up to you, your physical therapist to really be knowledgeable and do that full extensive evaluation. Like I don't, to me, I don't know if I necessarily need a script that says trigger point for the neck. You know, I should be able to do a full evaluation of a neck, look at the range of motion, the postural strength or, you know, um, poke around, find things myself. So if you're a patient, it's okay. You don't need a script that says trigger point therapy, trigger point release, manual therapy. This should all be included if you find the right therapist. But, um, you know, I think that that's when Dr. Roman talked about it, not having scripts or being kind of underutilized. It's not that these things don't exist, but I think that the doctor can very well see that, okay, this patient needs physical therapy. It's, you know, we have two separate ways of treating and it's physical therapy, it's our forte to kind of be able to evaluate and get this patient healed up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So let's say you have a painful trigger point. What's, what's next? So absolutely. Um, again, there's other people, other types of practitioners that treat trigger points. Chiropractors do other types of specialties do, but like I've said in past, past podcasts, I don't know what all I don't have training as a chiropractor. So we're going to focus on the physical therapy side mm -hmm. of things. But I, it's, 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 I don't know, in a way it's kind of sad, but um, there was a 1991 study in our own physical therapy journal. And this, um, and I don't recall exactly how many people they, they, they pulled or what all this was, but they said only, 4% of physical therapists like treating the chronic pain patient. Um, now, you, 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 we, I bring it up because chronic pain patients will have trigger points. Um, and so I was, my first uh, dry, dry needling course was approximately uh, two months ago. It was, um, we had maybe 35 to 40, uh, mostly physical therapists. I think a few athletic trainers in the room as well. But our instructor, so okay, let, let, let's just say there was 40 people there. And her instructor said, How many of you like treating chronic pain? So there was there was 40 people in there. And of the 40%, I think there was three of us that raised their hand, including me. So three out of 40 like treating chronic pain. And that's really, um, it's, it's, it's sad. I, I'm not sure why that is because that's one of the main things that a physical therapist does is, 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 is treat pain. I think some of it is why um, a lot of people don't like treating chronic pain is they're not in the environment that allows that to happen. You can't go into a 
um, busy outpatient clinic where one therapist might be treating two or three patients at a time, you can't do that and get treated effectively if you have chronic pain. You you just you just you just can't. And so that could be why. I don't know why. Um, but you know, the study along what I saw in my my myopain course. Oh, myopain. Hey, think about becoming a sponsor of the uh, Healthy Habits for Active Aging podcast, right, Lauren? <laughs> that that could be good for my. That would be so great. <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh, so when you and so it's so important to if you have these trigger points and chronic pain, as we've talked about in past podcasts, or find the right phys- physical therapist. Um, you know, we all have um, our own specialties that we like treating. So make sure that you find one because as we start talking about dry needling next week, that's not something that a physical therapist, um, not all of us do. You know, there's there's kind of post graduate training you have to take for that. So and yeah, I I would chime in here too by saying like as a young therapist, I mean Mike's been treating for thirty years. For him to be able to confidently raise his hand and say like I like to treat chronic pain. We're talking about somebody who understands the neuroscience of pain. Like he has treated I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of patients with chronic pain. Okay. I've been treating for five years. And if you would have asked me this question in my first two, possibly three years out of school, I would have said, nope, don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole because as a therapist, like your confidence just isn't there. I could treat post-ops, you know, but for patients that come in and they're already feeling helpless. They've been to several other PTs, possibly plenty of doctors. They're just feeling like nothing will help them. And then you're like somebody with not a lot of experience. That's just thinking, Oh my gosh, I'm in over my head. But now that I've understood the neuroscience of pain, I've gotten my hands more on patients. I'm like excited to be the first one that will say, let me help you. We need to have you understand what the neuroscience of pain is and why you're having chronic pain, how we need to retrain your brain, um, dry needling, all these different um, manual therapy, all these different things that we can help you. Like I get excited to tell people about, wow, I'm so happy you have found us. I can work with you one-on-one and let's understand this together and move forward. So I think that's the difference between why PTs, maybe they aren't confident with chronic pain or they don't have enough time Mm one-on-one. And so Dr. Gorman brought up a really good point of for him and those two other people to be able to raise their hand and say, yeah, any day I got this, you know, um, find that PT or search for that or ask your doctor if they have any recommendations for therapists that they've had with their other patients that have success. So off my soapbox, but that was my... <laughs> good. That was, wow. I haven't I... heard you get on your soapbox like that for a while, but I'm really, that was, guys, that was like, not scripted. <laughs> so important that patients feel comfortable with their PT and have the right one. So. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I, t- I tell everyone not to go, not to stand up on the soapbox, but um, I believe that I, 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 a patient, um, needs to not think of a physical therapist as a commodity. And what what I mean by that is 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 we're not all equal. And Lauren could do things that I can't do. And so if a patient came to me for something that Lauren's great, I would I would refer that patient to Lauren in, in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. So we have we have to kind of think about that. So if you're in as we've always said, if you're in an area where you don't know the physical therapist in that area, Please re- reach out to Dr. Ben or I. Just send us an email info at imovephysicaltherapy.com. We're more than happy to help you. Um, I can, you know, we can definitely help you find the right person for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, with treating trigger points, we definitely, you definitely are going to need to, to receive manual therapy. There needs to be um, soft tissue mo- mobilization done to that trigger point. Because we need to improve oxygen flow to that trigger point. Um, we need to improve blood flow to that trigger point. A trigger point, this isn't a very scientific term, but it's kind of, a, it's a gunked up area in a mm. muscle. And it's, and this gunked up area is is depriving the muscle from blood flow and oxygen. And it's, it's not going to go away unless it gets worked. And that's where and I, I, again, I've been a, a, a manual therapist for 25 years, and I know that my manual techniques have been very effective, but I do think that dry needling allows 
you to get deeper into the area to really get at that deep trigger point. But we'll talk a lot, a lot, um, a lot more about that tomorrow. But we, um, you know, so you definitely need the right kind of treatment. And then once we, you know, inhibit or deactivate that that trigger point, well, then there has to be a real movement exercise component to your program. Um, I definitely think that you need to work on getting, you know, we need to work, Lauren and I need to work on getting that trigger point to calm down, to re release that trigger point. But then there has to be active movement and retraining the muscular system on what it's got to do because it's probably forgot what, what it should do. So there is a chance that that trigger point can come back if retraining is not is not performed. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say I get the question too, oh, can I just go to a massage therapist and get this worked out? Yeah, okay, that's fine. But you also are missing the other total half of the program, which is your home exercise program, which, you know, your therapist needs to be able to, to work out the tissue and do the manual therapy to in order to get this blood flow and oxygen back into the area that's so called gunked up and break it up. But if you're not doing the exercises on the back half of restoring normal movement patterns, postural strengthening and seeing how the muscle will respond to movements and resistance and lifting a laundry basket or your grandchild again, we're just going to be going to the massage therapist. I mean, every other week for the rest of our life. So, um, having a therapist teach you the right home exercise program, you're going to do it on your own. They're going to progress it. Look at your workstation setup. We've talked about this so many times and we have, you know, refer back to a previous podcast. How should your chair be positioned? So your shoulders aren't hiked up into your ears. Um, what is a good chair for you? How should the screen be? So refer back to a different podcast on that. Um, but stress reduction, breathing techniques, all of this stuff goes hand in hand. You cannot just fix your trigger point and assume it's never going to come back. I was a softball pitcher and yeah, I would want to dig into it with one of those massage guns as much as I can, but if I'm not working the strength of my rotator cuff with, um, weights and bands and, um, functional movement patterns that my trainer would show me, it's just going to keep coming back. So, um, home exercise programs, make sure you do your homework on the back end of that and ask your therapist about it. And when are you ready for it? And that should be part of the plan. You should not just be going to get a massage every time. <laughs> so um, as much as great. that sounds great. <laughs> okay. So, um, Dr. Gorman, did you have any more to elaborate before we answer our quiz question? No, I think it's time to get right into the quiz question. So we're going to test your knowledge and Lauren, who was, uh, Dr. Janet Travell, she was a personal physician for which president? It was JFK, John sure F. Kennedy. Yeah, mm -hmm. it sure was. It sure was. Okay. So, that's, I wonder how many people knew that. Hmm. Well, I didn't know. know that until I went to my, my myopain course. I probably know that. <laughs> I didn't know it until 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again um, for joining us today. Trigger points are a real concern. They're so pop, like so prevalent. 90% of people always say experience them or have them. So please, you know, understand this is this is a problem and can be addressed and lead to chronic pain. So please have it addressed for your pain to decrease. Um, we cannot say it enough to find the correct healthcare professional for you, the right PT to work on your trigger points and implement a home exercise program. And we're so excited for next week. Dr. Gorman's been working so hard on his dry needling um, certificate. And so he's going to share with us more about how dry needling can help with trigger points and chronic pain. And as always, we're so grateful for you all that tune in every week to us. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our podcast of Healthy Habits for Active Aging. And we are always looking for new topics. So if you have something, please email us at info at imovephysicaltherapy.com. And also, if you want to see our faces and our makeshift <laughs> offices, you can tune into our iMove PT YouTube channel. <laughs> we hope you have a great week and stay with us next week for the dry needling course. Have a great day. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Healthy Habits for Active Aging podcast. 
If you have any questions for Dr. Gorman or Dr. Bennett, please send an email to info at imovephysicaltherapy.com. To learn more about healthy aging, visit our website at imovephysicaltherapy.com. Like what you hear? Be sure to rate and subscribe. See you next week.